Hi everybody, this is James Tompkins and welcome to Lecture 3 of the Advanced Corporate Finance Series where we begin the topic of capital structure. So what I'll do is I'll start off the way I usually do and that is with uh, an agenda and basically if you're in my class we do the theory and practice of capital structure. Of course online it's just going to be the theory and I'll be starting off with capital structure in perfect markets and then imperfect markets, that, that's all the theory part. And then I'll be getting to the case, which is about bridging theory with practice. Now, the agenda is going to make more sense if I first ask two questions first. So, first of all, what is meant by a firm's capital structure? Well, what do you think of when you think about capital? Well, if you're an accountant, you might think about buildings and things like that. But if you're a finance person, basically, capital means money, okay? And, and structure means basically, in this situation, well, you know, what percentage of debt or what percentage of equity do I want, just as an example? So that's as simple as it is. That, that's what we mean by capital structure. Now, the second question is, well, what do I mean by perfect markets? Is that where all the salaries neatly arranged and, well, actually, perfect markets assume several things. Number one, no taxes, no transaction costs, and in the context of what we'll discuss with capital structure, in particular, I mean no bankruptcy or financial distress costs, and I'll talk about the difference between those two in a later lecture and no information asymmetries. What, what do I mean by no information asymmetry? Well, symmetry, you know what symmetrical means, right? So the left side of my face is the same as the right side of my face. That's symmetrical. And A comes from the Latin. Can't believe I'm telling you about Latin since uh, I failed that subject. But anyway, A means without. So no information asymmetry. So, so that would be assuming that, for example, Steve Jobs, when he was alive, knew as much about Apple Computer as I knew about Apple Computer, or Apple rather. Okay? So, are these perfect market assumptions, would you say they're realistic? I mean, do we have taxes? We do, right? And are there transaction costs? There are, right? Of course. And, and does the CEO of IBM know more about IBM than I do, or, or the outside world, the public? Well, of course, right? So, so basically, these assumptions, realistic or unrealistic? Unrealistic, right? And yet, today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these, the capital structure decision under these unrealistic conditions. So, and we're going to make one other assumption, too, and I'll tell you about it in a minute, but but my question is, well, why bother saying, all right, well, this is the importance of the capital structure decision when assuming perfect markets, when we know perfect markets are not realistic? Why bother with that? Well, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to see how the world works in this very simple, even though it's unrealistic world, right? And then gradually, one by one, we'll start removing the assumptions and we'll see how the world changes. And so eventually our goal will be to look at, well, what is the importance of the capital structure decision in the realistic world? So that's, that's basically how we're going to go about it. And in this particular series, or in this particular lecture rather, we're going to look at, well, how important is the capital structure decision? In other words, how important is firm value, or how important is the stock price, or, or whatever, okay? under perfect market assumptions and, and one other assumption that I'll bring up in a minute. Then in a future lecture, we'll add in taxes, and then we'll add in things like transaction costs, and we'll look at the impact of information asymmetries, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's where we're headed, but today it's simply uh, perfect markets, or rather in this lecture, it's strictly the capital structure decision in perfect markets. So. Let me, let me tell you what this is going to uh, 
involved. Num number one, we'll discuss the assumptions, because as I mentioned, there's one more assumption that is not part of the Perfect Markets edition. And then we'll look at these, these two guys, that they came up with these two propositions. May maybe you've heard of them, Miller and Modigliani, okay? And in proposition number one, they said, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter whether we have 20% debt and 80% equity or, or no debt and all equity or 50-50. It, it doesn't matter. You know, Under a given set of assumptions, total firm value will not be impacted. And that was their proposition number one. And, and proposition number two, they said, well, guess what? Neither will the stock price be impacted. So it doesn't matter if it's 20% debt or 50% debt or, or whatever, you, know, you, you will not affect the stock price. So let's get into the assumptions, okay? Now the first assumption is that the asset investment decision is fixed. In other words, I don't care whether I raise 20% debt with 80% equity or 50-50 or, or no debt, I'm going to invest in my lemonade stand no matter what. Right, because I mean, what what is an asset investment decision? What, what is it? Maybe I'll, I should start off with that. What what is an example of an asset investment decision? Well, it's what a company spends its money on, right? So, for example, if I uh, just uh, represent the firm real quick, say assets of a hundred and say debt of forty and equity of sixty. Okay, so. Basically, this, this is the asset investment decision. This is what a company spends its money on. And as we saw in Lecture 1, this is what? This is the financing decision or, or the capital structure decision. So, so again, what, what does finance mean? Well, have you bought a car recently or ever bought a car? And how did you finance it? Right? Finance means to raise money. Okay, so the financing or capital stru structure decision is not about, well, I wonder if I'll raise money or not, because do you have to raise money to spend it on something? You, you do, right? So the financing decision is, given that I raise money, okay, what is its structure going to be? Is it going to be no debt or 50% debt or whatever? Okay, and, and the asset investment decision, that's what you spend your money on. So what are some examples of asset investment decisions? Well, maybe a firm Coke building a new bottling company. Boeing investing in the Dreamliner, the, the 787. What about hiring a CEO? Well, sure. Is that something you spend money on? Yeah. When, when Ford hired, what's his name, Alan Mulhaley or something like that from Boeing? Okay, that was an asset investment decision. Do you, do you see the CEO on the balance sheet? No, that's accounting. But from a finance perspective... The asset investment decision is what you spend your money on. So assumption number one here is that, you know what? I have a plan for what I'm going to spend my money on. I'm going to, I'm going to spend money on my lemonade stand no matter what. That's my asset investment decision. And it doesn't matter whether I have no debt or 80% debt. I'm still going to spend money on my lemonade stand. So that, that's the first assumption. And the next assumption is essentially all those perfect market assumptions. So we're going to assume no corporate or personal taxes. We're going to assume no transaction costs, which, as I mentioned before, includes bankruptcy costs and financial distress costs. And we assume no information asymmetries. So essentially, under those two sets of assumption, number one, the asset investment decision is fixed. And number two, perfect markets. Miller and Medigliani say, you know what, hey, not only is total firm value unimpacted, but even the stock price is not impacted. So what does that mean? What's the implication of that? You know, if they can show that under those two sets of assumptions, that the capital structure decision is not important, it doesn't impact firm value or stock price, then what is the implication? Well then, it must mean that if the capital structure decision is important, that it's either important because of, hey, you know, it has an impact on the asset investment decision. In other words, to give my example, gosh, you know, because I, I raised money with 80% debt or, 
or and 20% equity, I, I'm going to change my mind about on my lemonade stand. I'm not going to invest in my lemonade stand. Okay, so so may, maybe capital structure choices impact the asset investment decision. Well, maybe it's taxes. Okay, maybe you know you know what T taxes is the most important thing that's going to drive how much debt I choose to have. Or, or, or maybe it's bankruptcy. You know, may, maybe as I'm putting together my capital structure, I'm thinking, well, gosh, I, I, I better ha not have as much debt because you know, my bankruptcy costs may go up or, or, or whatever, or the expected bankruptcy costs. Or, or maybe it has an impact on information asymmetry. May, maybe if I issue a bunch of debt, I'm not saying this is the case, I'm just you know, creating an example, that, that, uh, that it means that the public, the, the gap of information between what the public knows and what the CEO of IBM knows Maybe that's less, and, and maybe that's a good thing, or maybe that's a bad thing. These are all issues that we'll discuss. But in any case, before we move on, you know, what do you think? What do you think is the most important driver when a firm makes its capital structure decision? Do you think it's the asset investment decision? You know, it's that the business that they're in is what drives their capital structure choices? Do you think they're thinking about taxes? Maybe bankruptcy costs or information asymmetries. Go ahead, just write it down or whatever. T take a vote in the quietness of your own mind. And uh, by the end of two more lectures, okay, because it's going to take two more lectures of theory, we'll have our answer, huh? Give you some suspense. All right, so let's begin with Miller Medigliani proposition number one, okay? So basically, do you remember what they say? Well, with the combined set of assumptions, so fixed asset investment decisions, so no matter what, no matter how I choose to raise money, I'm still going to invest in my lemonade stand, and all the perfect market assumptions, they basically say, you know what? Total firm value is not impacted. Okay, so this, this first proposition, it's about total firm value. Okay, so, so in this context of this diagram here, you know, it doesn't matter how I choose to raise money, whether it's 40, 60, or, or whether it's, uh, let me add in another, you know, 20, 80. Okay, so whether it's 40, 60, or 20, 80, or whatever, you know, total firm value is still going to be 100. So this first proposition is not about the relative value of debt and equity. It's, it's about total firm value. And basically, there are two arguments. Uh, th there's more than two arguments, but I'll, I'll discuss two arguments that, that support this assertion. Okay, number one is a qualitative or, if you will, logical argument. And number two is an arbitrage argument. Okay? So let's take a look. Okay? So, so remember, assumption number one was that, is this guy fixed? It is, right? So, so no matter what, I'm going to invest in my lemonade stand, and that's fixed. Okay, so ba essentially what that does is it, 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 it sort of puts a, uh, <clears throat> a cap, if you will, around where cash flows can be. So the, the left-hand side of the balance sheet is fixed. Now, perfect market forces, basically, they say, you know what? There's no relative advantage between, say, debt and equity. So, for example, with the taxes, okay, does, is, is without taxes, is, is the notion of interest being tax deductible, is that relevant or irrelevant? It's irrelevant, right? And so basically the argument is, you know, how you choose to, to finance is not going to change firm value. I mean, an, an analogy that Miller and Medigliani actually used in their paper is you can think of the left-hand side as the size of the total pie. And you can think of how you choose to structure your capital as, or, or pizza pie, I should say. And you could think of the right-hand side of how you choose to you know, cut up that pizza, whether it's eight slices or four slices. Does that change the size of the pizza? It doesn't, right? And so that's basically a, a qualitative or logical argument as to you know, how you slice the pizza, how the number of slices, does not impact the total size of the pizza. Now another argument is arbitrage. 
Now, now what is arbitrage? Well, let me just give you a quick example of arbitrage, okay? Um, in case you don't know. So imagine that, say, Ford, and I, I have no idea what their stock price is right now, but imagine that Ford on the New York Stock Exchange is trading at, say, um, $50 a share. And on the London Stock Exchange, after you adjust for transaction costs and exchange rates and so on and so forth, imagine that they're trading for $48 a share. Okay? So in London, Ford is trading at 48 and in New York at 50 Okay? Now, if that were the case, what would people be motivated to do? Would they motiv be motivated to buy or sell in London? Buy, right? And with the same push the button, they'd be motivated to buy or sell in New York. Sell, right? Because for every share they did that, you'd make $2 in profits. And that's an example of an arbitrage opportunity. In this case, it's a riskless arbitrage opportunity because with one push of the button at a point in time for the identical security, you're locking in $2 a share of profits. Now, if everybody's buying in London, what would you expect to happen to the price in London? Expect it to go up, right? So maybe it goes up to, say, 49 okay? And if everybody's selling in New York, then what would you expect to happen to the price in New York? Go down, right? So maybe it goes down to 49 So, So now the price has moved until there's no longer an arbitrage opportunity. And so that, that's what an arbitrage opportunity is. And so an arbitrage op opportunity argument can, that, that supports Miller Medigliani's theorem number one is essentially, well, you know what? If there were an optimal capital structure, can so, could somebody buy this firm for a thousand, then rearrange it, and then sell it for a higher value? They could, right? And so Assuming no arbitrage opportunities, then you could make the argument that, well, under perfect market assumptions and, and a fixed asset investment decision, that debt policy or the capital structure decision is irrelevant. So that's Miller and Medigliani number one. Hey, fixed asset investment decision, perfect markets, total firm value is going to stay the same. And so therefore... The capital structure choice is relevant or irrelevant? Irrelevant. Not, not important. So let's move on to Miller and Medigliani number two. Okay. So number one was about total firm value. What, what was, what's number two about? Stock price, right? Or the relative value between debt and equity. So let's, let's go through that argument. So they're saying, hey, you know, fixed asset investment decision perfect markets, you know what, you're not going to impact stock price either. And so therefore, the capital structure decision, important or unimportant? Unimportant. So let me ask you this. Let's say we have a given stock and its risk, which we'll measure by beta. And by the way, if, if you're not sure about beta, if you, if you go through my corporate finance series, there's six lectures in total. Uh, it, it works up to not just what beta is, but why it is what it is. Uh, but, but in any case, that's how we, that's how we measure risk. Okay? And so you, you've learned that for a given beta, investors require return. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take on some risk, but hey, it, it's going to cost you with some required return. Now, is that like a price of risk? It is, right? It, it's like, I mean, think of buying something. Maybe you bought a textbook, okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I'll take this textbook, but from you, but it's, it's going to cost, right? You have to pay for the textbook, all right? So I'll take on some risk, but hey, it's going to cost. I, I require a certain return, okay? So, so let me ask you this, okay? Suppose for a given stock, the price of risk went up, okay? So in other words, you know, for for a given change in risk investors required an even higher required return. Okay, well, what would you expect to have in the stock price? 
Would that be happy face or sad face if, if, if investors required an even higher return than they did before? Be sad face, right? So you expect the stock price to go down, right? And what about the other way around? Okay, what if the price of risk went down? So in other words, you say, all right, well, I'll take on a certain amount of risk, and it's only going to require just a little bit more return. Would that be happy face or sad face? Be happy face, right? If you already own, own the stock, right? Because the stock price would do what? Go up, right? Now, what about this third scenario? Okay, suppose the price of risk stays the same. No, it's for a given change in risk, I require the same amount of more return. So in other words, risk and, and return, or the price of risk, to be more specific about it, are going up and down by the exact same amount. Then, would the stock price change? It wouldn't, right? And if I could show you that risk and return, I'm, I'm speaking loosely now just to make it maybe more intuitive, if I could show you that risk and return go up and down by the exact same amount as debt, percentage debt changes, okay, then does that make capital structure important or unimportant? Unimportant with respect to stock price, right? So, so I'm going to, I'll be, I'll be more technical on the next slide, but, but right now I'm just going to speak loosely just to get the intuition across. Okay. So, so let's say you own a stock and, 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 and you're locked in a required return. Risk goes up. Happy face or sad face? Sad face, right? Okay. And, and uh, because stock price would go down. What if you own a stock and, and, and the required return is locked in and, and risk goes down? Happy face or sad face? Happy face, right? You know, hey, you know, you get to keep your same required return and, and, and the risk has gone down. But, but what if risk and return go up and down by the exact same proportion? Would stock price be impacted? It wouldn't, right? So I'm being a little bit loose with that explanation to get the intuition across. But if we want to be a little bit more technical about it, to, talking in terms of price of risk, well, let's look at this slide. Okay. So, so here we have, you know, let's, let's begin with uh, a situation where we're at, at line one, right? Point none. Okay. So we have risk and required returns. Okay. So what this is saying is that, you know, for this amount of more risk, I require this much amount of more return right? Now, if we go to scenario two, for the same amount of more risk, do I require a bunch more return? I do, right? Which means you'd expect the stock price to go up or go down? Go down, right? And what about if we go from scenario one to scenario three? Okay, for this amount, same amount of more risk, I require just a little bit more return. So, what has happened to the price of risk, gone up or gone down? It's gone down, right? So you expect the stock price to do what? To go up. But if we go from scenario one to scenario four, you know, for this amount more risk, I require this amount more return. And then we go to scenario four, well, for the same amount of more risk, I require the same amount of more return. What happens to the stock price? It stays the same, right? And so essentially, you know, what we're going to do is that we're going to show that as a firm's percentage of debt to equity increases, those required returns on equity increase in the same proportion as the beta. In other words, the required return and the beta are going to go up and down by the same amount. So what that means is as a firm increases its debt, the required return goes up at the same rate as beta, which would mean the stock price would or would not change. Would not change, right? So let's go ahead and show that. We're going to illustrate that. And, and I'll start off with some notation. Okay? So I'll try to make it intuitive. So A for assets, D for debt, E for equity, and here are the required returns of assets, equity, and debt with these subscripts. Okay? Now, if you recall from the weighted average cost of capital, or if you again, if you go through the corporate finance series, okay, uh, weighted average cost of capital, percentage debt times the required rate of return of debt, plus percentage equity times the required rate of return of equity, 
Okay, remember, we're ignoring taxes. We're saying there's no taxes. So basically, the required rate of return of the assets is this percentage debt times the required rate of return of debt plus this percentage equity times the required rate of return of equity. And, and what I, what I want to show is I, I'm interested in, well, how does the required rate of return, if we're looking at stock price, let me put it this way, if we're looking at stock price, which of these required returns am I interested in? The asset, the debt, or the equity? The equity, right? So if I rearrange this formula, you know, do some algebra and see what RE is equal to, basically it's going to rearrange to this guy. So here's my required rate of return of equity. And we can see how it, it increases as this debt to equity ratio increases. Okay? So so that so so in other words, the, the required rate of return of equity rises in direct proportion to this debt equity ratio. Now, if I could show you that the beta of equity rises in the exact same proportion, so required returns are going up and down by the exact same percentage as beta of equity is going up and down with this exact same debt equity ratio, then would would capital structure impact or not impact stock price? It would not impact stock price, right? So that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do next. We're going to look at the firm's equity beta. Now, in the corporate finance series, okay, what what model did we develop that linked the required rate of return of equity to the equity of beta? It was the CAPM model, right? And there it is. There it is, right there. Okay. So, so again, you can go to those other lecture series if, uh, if if you need more help with that. And so here we have a relationship between the required rate of return of equity and the and the beta of equity. By the way, could I say there's a similar relationship between the required rate of return of assets and the beta of assets? Sure. Why not? Okay, and what about debt? You know, is there is could I apply this to debt? The required rate of return of debt is related to the beta of debt? I could, right? So, so in other words, you could apply this CAPM model to anything that has a beta, right? So, so what I want to do now is I want to say, all right, well, if I wanted to, for, for each of these guys, could I substitute in the CAPM formula? So in other words, right here, I would put in what? Well, we saw on the previous slide that the require. I'll, I'll go back to the previous slide. Okay, that the required rate of return of equity is this guy right here, right? So if I wanted to, could I substitute that cap M formula in there? I could, right? And I could. Can I substitute the cap M formula for debt there? Sure. And can I do the same there? I could, right? And so if I, if I make all those substitutions and do all the algebra, which I'm not going to do online here, but if I did all the algebra, I'd basically come up with that guy. So if the equity of beta is the asset beta plus its debt equity ratio times that difference in betas. So if we look at both formulas together, and we've got the retired, required weight of return of equity, which relates to a firm's what? to its debt, to its assets, or to its stock. To its stock, right? And we see how it rises and falls in direct proportion to this debt-equity ratio. But also, its, its, its risk, measured by its beta, also rises and falls by the exact same amount in proportion to this debt-equity ratio. And so if that's true, if the required rate of return equity and the risk quantified by its beta, go up and down by the exact same amount according to the debt-equity ratio, then as you change the debt-equity ratio and therefore change a firm's capital structure, will it or will it not impact stock price? It will not impact stock price. And so that was Miller and Medigliani's proposition number two. And so therefore what we've seen in this lecture is that, number one, in this unrealistic world, if we assume that the asset investment decision is fixed, so no matter what, I'm going to invest in my lemonade stand, 
And if we make those unrealistic, perfect market assumptions, so no taxes, no transaction costs, uh, no information asymmetries, that basically, number one, does total firm value matter? Is, is that impacted by a firm's capital structure? It's not, right? And is stock, stock price impacted? It's not, right? So in other words, this whole capital structure decision on the, under those unrealistic assumptions means that capital structure is or is not important. It's not, right? And so therefore, if, if it is important, it must be because one, of the, one or more of those assumptions are violated. It must be because, hey, you know, it, it's important because taxes drive the, the capital structure decision or bankruptcy, expected bankruptcy costs or, or whatever. And so that's what we're going to do in the next couple of lectures. You know, the next one is going to be about capital structure and taxes. So we'll see what happens when we you know, maintain all the same assumptions except we'll throw and uh, see how important or unimportant capital structure is when we include first corporate taxes and then personal taxes. And then, and then a lecture later, then we'll look at things like you know, transaction costs and bankruptcy costs and financial distress, et cetera, et cetera. In any case, I hope this was a good learning experience and hope to see you at the next lecture. Thank you and bye-bye.